Hi, everyone. Uh, I think we're going to start the session. A quick uh, few questions before we start. Uh, just by a show of hands, uh, how many people here are, uh, have, a, sorry, have a finance, uh, finance background? Professionally. Professionally, yes. All right. Uh, how many people here uh, are entrepreneurs? All right. OK, so we basically, uh, all right. The idea is uh, to go through financial statements. And I, I, I am sure that you, most of you understand financial statements. So this is going to be a quick brief, one slide, just the three statements. We move into sources of financing, the different structure, uh, different things, that the, uh, debt and equity, and then a valuation approach. And we'll end it with a Q&A session for everyone to ask questions that they might have. All right, so yes, this might seem elementary, but uh, more of a definition of an income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow. Uh, the idea here is that um, you know, when you look at income statements, obviously the revenue, and you go down to uh, the gross profit, and EBITDA, EBITDA being your operating income, which takes away everything uh, directly related to expenses. Uh, and when you move down towards net income, you, you remove depreciation, interest expense, and taxes, which in the UAE, there are none, but if your operations around, around the region. Uh, balance sheet, again, uh, has three main things, asset, liabilities, and shareholders' equity, which are divided between uh, the current and uh, long term, depending on how long, I mean, depending on a year. If it's within the year, the current, and otherwise, they become long term. Um, and a very important formula at the end, which is an assets e equals liabilities plus shareholders' equity, which is a balancing figure. Um, look at cash flows. Uh, the cash flows, uh, I mean, it basically shows you how, how the actual money or the business move, how cash flows through the year between in the, within the business. So now, what are financial statements? Financial statements show you where the co company's money came from, where it went and where, where it is now. So while people don't give too much importance to balance sheets and cash flow statements, I mean, we believe that those are the two, mo two of the most important uh, statements there. Um, and again, another key element, accrual accounting. People, uh, project-based uh, project ba project -based businesses, usually account for expenses uh, within a year and don't book a revenue until the end of the year, until, until when they actually get the revenue. And that creates somewhat a conflict because you, you end up expensing, your, expensing, expensing yourself one year and possibly accru accounting for that revenue some, uh, next year. So it has to be within the same period of time, usually. Uh, the revenue and then there's a cost of goods sold item where basically all the variable costs that are associated with delivering that service are recorded and uh, then you have your overheads basically the the cost of uh, the C the CEO salary the salary of the finance person the marketing manager uh, uh, salary so if you see a simple income statement it would be sales it would have cost of goods sold it will give you gross profit, and then you deduct from gross profit your overhead expenses, and then basically gives you your net income. It basically gets complicated as the, as the organization grows. Uh, you have your interest expenses coming in, and then if you have fixed asset, you have to, uh, have a, you have to uh, allow for depreciation to be included in your income statement. So for, for a small, medium enterprise business, which is like at the early stage of the businesses, I think it would be very simple sort of a sales, cost of goods sold, and gross profit and then your operating income. That's simple for, for small, medium enterprise. And just a quick review of the ratios that people look at. Uh, people tend to, uh, you know, small businesses tend to look at net income as the biggest, uh, net income and net margin is the biggest, uh, biggest driver, biggest indicator of how well the business is doing. And we believe that uh, the number of other ratios uh, that, that should be looked at could be, bal uh, could be a balance sheet ratio, uh, could be a debt to equity ratio, working capital, which is essential, uh, trying to grow the business from where it is. Uh, a current ratio, which basically measures how the company's ability to meet uh, the short-term financial obligations. Um, and when you look at uh, across statements, there's an inventory turnover uh, ratio. There is a receivables to turnover ratio, which sees, which basically measures uh, the number of days that credit sales remain in outstanding before they collect it. Uh, another important one is an interest coverage ratio, which basically sees whether your cash flows can actually sustain, uh, sustain the interest or the debt that you have on your books. Um, 
two important ratios which uh, people tend to forget is your return on assets, which basically may take a measure of how, how uh, well your, your assets, asset base is actually uh, churning and uh, income, uh, income generating actually. I think the main point of this, this slide was that the quality of earnings is much more important than the earnings itself. So rather than looking at net income, the point is saying, okay, what part of the net income is actually generating into, a, into cash flows uh, from opera operations? So that's, that's the end result of that. Yeah. I'm going to pass it on to Sakib, who's going to talk about uh, the different forms of uh, financing. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to start with this slide to really set the context of, um, in terms of sources of financing. It's a big issue. I'm, it's, a bi it's been a big topic today. Um, we, Farhan and I had a session earlier which talked about um, problems facing U uh, SMEs in the UAE. And the number one problem that came out immediately was access to capital, access to sources of financing for growth. Um, so we'll touch on all these things. Um, wanted to start off by, this is a slide that many of you might be familiar with. It's really the life cycle of a company. And, and the reason I wanted to use this slide to start off is because different companies at different stages in their evolution have different needs. And they also have diff different sort of risk profiles. So at, the, at, at sort of the earliest stage, the developmental stage, you really, it's just, you're talking about an idea and a concept. It's an unproven business model, the product's being developed. As the companies grow, they, so, they sort of reach a, a, a stage where they're revenue generating. They, potentially proven their business model, but they're still not generating positive cash flow. And then they start to get to this hyper growth phase where they have a proven business model, they need capital for expansion, and um, they're really just uh, in a stage of high growth. After that, you have more of a mature phase where companies uh, have an established brand name, at this point they're generating cash flow, and, and then it sort of goes into this final stage, which could or could not be true. It could go into a decline. They could reinvent their business model. But again, the, the risks here, and I've, out, I've outlined three, are different at different stages. Here you have business model risk, which is gonna attract a certain type of investor. Here you have execution risk, again, where the business model is proven, but it's about executing on that business plan will attract a different type of investor. And here you have, you know, for, for lack of a better word, I've called it maintenance risk, but where you have a sort of a, a mature company and, and, and you have a different type of investor who's interested in that type of risk associated with that. Now, when it comes to financing, I guess there, there are two options, right? There's equity and there's debt financing. So we'll talk about both of those. We'll start off talking about the types of equity financing. If we look at the first one here, which is um, personal funding, I mean, I think I... You know, people, entrepreneurs in the room such as Derv will be able to tell you that this is an important component of any SME, any startup. How much personal uh, capital does the owner of the business have to put into the business? You know, there was a recent survey done in the U.S. where seven out of ten businesses basically got their start from their own personal finances primarily. And the way that they got the majority of that money was by mortgaging their house and putting that money into their business. So the important thing I think to, to think about when we talk about personal funding and, 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 that, and that topic is what type, of what type of environment are we operating in? What's the sort of characteristics of the ecosystem in which you operate? In the US, it's easy to mortgage your house and, and really do that because you have, you have access to sort of long-term mortgage financing. You have ba bankruptcy laws which are not gonna severely impact you should things go wrong. And so the access to personal, finance, uh, personal financing is gonna differ by market. Um, in, addition to, in, in addition to the capital that you put in directly, it's also important to note that personal, that, that the resources that you put in in terms of sweat equity and not taking a salary out of the business, that's actually a form of financing for your business. And so that needs to be taken into account as well. The next one on the list, so assuming that you sort of start your business with some personal funding, you get it up and running, you take it past the, the back of an envelope and you, you have a business, people generally turn to their family and friends. Um, this is sort of a common sort of approach in, in many parts of the world and, de and definitely over here in the Middle East. And these are people who are tied to the founder, obviously their family, friends. Um, the investment often comes in the form of loans. So they'll take a, someone will give a loan to the company. It's essentially equity, it's not really debt. It doesn't have debt-like features and they will use that to help grow the business. There's limited due diligence from investors at this stage, and in general, if you were to sort of go down this line, you would find that there's sort of an increasing level in general of sophistication 
and requirements as you sort of go down. And um, so at the family and friends level, it's more about who is this person, I know them, I have an emo emotional attachment to them. And then we get to sort of angel investors, which is somebody that you may not know, you may not know right now, but there's maybe a, a one or two degree of separation from. Um, they're generally successful business people, um, affluent investors. But even then, in those cases, I mean, generally the checks may be in, it's still in the range of, you know, something under $100,000. And um, the one thing to note about the angel investors is they're still not, it's, it's still not what we, what we would refer to as institutional capital. It's, it's still sort of closer to the friends, family than it is to the typical venture capital because the angel investors aren't operating out of a fund. They're investing their own money. They're not investing third party money where they have to give it back to their investors. So the, the, the requirements that they would have in terms of investing in your business and needing to exit your business within a certain time frame are a little bit different. So it's, a, it's an important, it's a, it's a very critical source of financing and, and, and you know, one that I would say in this region needs to pick up in a big way. Um, because the, the, the financing for sort of for seed stage startups is, is still difficult to get. Um, would like to hear some, you know, when you get to the Q&A session, the, there, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the room, so maybe they can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I will move on now to the sort of what we call the institutional capital. And the early one sort of being venture capital. And when we get to the institutional capital here, I think it's important to note that when investors um, at this institutional stage Getting capital for, from these people, I mean, generally it's about 2% of all companies that are going to qualify for, for capital in this stage. It's not going to be the majority of companies. I mean, venture capital and private equity firms generally target businesses, I mean, they'll look at 500 businesses before they invest in one, right? I mean, they're looking for very high growth, high potential businesses. So it's not necessarily, to, it's not necessarily that you don't have a business model that's not going to be profitable. It's just, is it going to meet the stringent requirements of somebody who's looking for a 35% plus IRR, right? Which is, which is uh, quite high. So again, the, one of the differences when you sort of make that leap from angel to venture is at the angel level, these are individuals. They're coming into a business. They're not going to take a board. They probably won't sit on a board. You probably don't have a board at that stage in your business. At the venture capital level, your business starts getting institutionalized. And these are people who sit on the board. These are people who take an active role in your business. And there, there are certain handcuffs that also come with that, that as an, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you would want to be aware of before you necessarily think about going actively down this route. Um, so just moving on, then once we get past the sort of venture stage, and, and if you sort of recall back here on this, you know, if the venture stage is sort of operating over here, then the, um, then the sort of growth capital stage is right around here. And in the growth capital stage, it's really, again, transitioning that business. Um, it's, it's, it's taking a sort of execution risk. The returns come down. So instead of 35% plus where, again, there's higher risk, there's lower risk here. So the returns generally come down, um, but they're still quite significant. And then in the last stage, when the company's mature, you have private equity. Private equity where there's stable cash flows, They'll look to leverage your business, put debt on top of it, acquire a company, and, and um, so that's really sort of the last stage when we talk about equity. I wanted to spend a little bit of time here um, just sort of going over the process from an institutional perspective and an understanding, is it for you as a sort of entrepreneur, as a business owner? First of all, just really sort of reiterating on the key features of, of, of equity. Um, and, Again, it's, it's permanent capital. It's the acquisition of shares of, in, a, in a company based on a sort of privately negotiated valuation. Um, these, are, these are shares that come with certain rights, certain shareholder rights, including protective provisions for minority shareholders and whatnot. Um, they're illiquid securities for the investor. So I think that you know, when you're a business owner, you have to keep that in mind. This is somebody who's coming into your business, and how is he going to ever exit the business? This is not a public stock that he can just sell and create value from. So, um, it's an illiquid security, and that drives sort of a risk premium that you see in, in, in sort of these types of transactions. What is the institutional investor approach? What is our approach? You know, for Han, Piyush, and I, both, uh, all three of us work at, uh, at the Riyadh Enterprise Development, which is a SME-focused uh, private equity fund. And, and how do we approach investments? Well, it, you know, it, it's quite diligent. I mean, we take a, you know, when, when we get introduced to a business to when we sort of close a transaction is a four-month process. And a lot of that time is actually uh, spent doing due diligence on a company, understanding their business. We negotiate very, very sort of um, 
very sort of detailed agreements when we come and become a shareholder in that company. How we're going to sit on the board? What are our rights going to be? Right? We're going to approve the business plan. We're going to, we're going to approve the hiring of a CFO. All these sort of things that come in, and it's a sort of a protracted, prolonged uh, negotiation process. But again, it's sort of tied to extensive due diligence, which is sort of a key aspect of the uh, private equity approach. But it's also alignment of interest. Because again, remember, we have to exit this business over a three to five year period. And so we want to make sure that we're properly aligned with and incentivized, have an incentivized management team who also is on the same page. So if it's a, if, if it's a, if it's a family business with, with family members dotted up and down the line in terms of the organizational chart, is that really a business that wants to sell in, in three, four years? Or are they looking to hold on to it forever as a sort of family heirloom? Because that, um, that sort of impacts your ability to monetize your shares in a privately held company. So these are sort of the things and the approach that we look at from a private equity um, perspective. You know, is it for you when you think about your, when you think about your business? Again, only 2% of companies are going to really ever qualify for institutional private equity. And they're going to be those with sort of high growth potential and, and those are, that are at an inflection point. Um, they're going to be those companies that are willing to and open to additional support and strategic support at the board level. Um, and I'll get to these two points next because it's really about, um, you know, w these two points are not about should I get equity, but I shouldn't probably get debt. I mean, in, 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 when I'm financing a business and if I have unpredictable, erratic cash flows, do I want to be levering up that business? No, probably not. So equity will probably make more sense. And same for a company that has maybe um, has had some issues in the past, maybe lost some money the last couple of years and is trying to shore up its balance sheet. Equity will be more appropriate than debt. And let's actually get to the debt sort of conversation because debt does make a lot of sense and debt is important within the sort of whole framework of uh, financing companies. I mean, what are the advantages of debt? Most of these are pretty obvious. Um, it's not dilutive. So if you're a business owner and you're going to finance your company, it's always attractive to get debt because you don't have to give up 35% of your company and half of your board and this right and that right. Um, it's, it's more cost efficient in raising equity. Uh, generally, your, your cost of equity is going to be significantly higher than your cost of debt. So it can help improve your sort of overall cost of capital for the business. It's tax efficient, again, probably less so in this region, in, in the UAE in particular, or the GCC, where you have less taxes. But otherwise, in a tax sort of driven environment, it can be, uh, that makes a big difference. I said less complicated. Uh, in terms of capital raising process, you know, th that just goes back to the three, four month lead time and all the work that goes into trying to raise private equity money and the frustrations that, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs go with in that process. In terms of banks, if you do qualify for bank loans, it's actually a much more efficient process. What are the disadvantages of debt? Well, first of all, it's not permanent capital. It does have to get paid back, right? Generally, there's a current interest and the outstanding principal has to get paid back. So there's those considerations. It increases the fixed cost of the business when you have that, when you have that fixed interest payment that's due, um, that, that, that's gonna increase your fixed cost base and to some degree the riskiness of your business. There's gonna be significant uh, coverage requirements, so it's not just free capital, and, uh, and, and, and the banks will monitor the performance of your business in a way that's different than private equity. Whereas sort of equity investors can take a three to five year horizon, you're not gonna see a bank come in and take a three to five year horizon on your business. So, your, your performance is going to be sort of um, analyzed more closely and more frequently with the bank loan, all things equal. And it's only capital. Uh, the banks aren't going to come in, sit on your board, provide you with, provide you with um, any strategic direction as you sort of grow your business. And that's one of the things that, at least at Riyadh Enterprise Development, when we look at deals, actually a lot of the deals, when people come to us with their SMEs, they're, they're quite well-run SMEs, they're good operations. Um, these are companies that if they wanted to, they could go to a bank and get financing. They could. And not dilute their ownership. But actually, they come to us because they'd rather have, you know, 50% of something that's four times as big and hope that the private equity investor can add that value to them than just simply getting a bank loan and growing marginally. The key considerations, I think we touched on a couple of these. You know, understanding the underlying nature of the cash flows and the revenues of your business to see if it's suitable for debt. You know, is it erratic? Is it, is it sort of 
Is it, is, it, is it a recurring income stream? Is it a predictable income stream? Is it sort of lumpy contracts? That, all of these things are going to impact how much debt you put on the business. Um, another one sort of here is proper matching of assets and liabilities or income in sort of your debt. Um, and what I mean by this is if you take a look at, I mean, the classic example as of late has been, I guess, a Lehman Brothers type situation where you had a company that had short-term debt and long-term assets and when, and that was, that whole sort of capital structure was predicated on the refinancing of that debt as if it would never stop. And when it did stop, all of a sudden you had to, you had these assets that were not so liquid and you had to cover your debt. And that can create a sort of, a sort of vicious circle, a vicious spiral. So you want to make sure, even if you are going to bring debt into your business, if you're going to finance a long-term project, you don't want to finance it with short-term debt. Okay, let me move on here. Now, there are different types of debt, and I just wanted to go over this quickly. And again, not all of this actually applies to the region so much over here. It's worth knowing what these different types of debt are. And I, I think that these are some of the things that uh, banks in the region, governments in the region need to address to make sure that there is more different types of debt available in the market. Um, you know, in sort, of a, in sort of a more advanced market, you would have different layers of debt, the senior debt, this is generally, the, this is probably the, um, it's the most senior debt on the balance sheet. It's the least expensive because again, if I were to go down the line here, least risky down to most risky. So I mean, again, with the sort of risk return um, calculation, this is gonna be the sort of cheapest piece of debt. And it's gonna be generally secured against assets of the business. So um, if you have any assets, it'll have a first lien on those assets. It will generally be priced at a premium to LIBOR. Um, there, there'll be collateral coverage at, you know, if, if it's not covered by specific assets, maybe they will go two times your cash flow or you know, two times your EBITDA, whatever that, whatever that relevant figure is for your business. They will stretch, but not, they won't stretch very far. It's very sort of low risk debt and, uh, and lower cost. It will have extensive covenants. And if your business were to ever liquidate, this would be the sort of first, um, first, not the first liability, but the first piece of debt on your balance sheet to get paid back. You have unsecured debt. And I think this is missing in the region. I mean, you'll, you'll find secured debt, especially if you pledge, you know, if you, per, if you give a personal guarantee, if you pledge certain assets, you'll get, you'll, you'll get the um, senior secured debt if you have the right assets. The unsecured debt, which is basically taking a look at the cash flows of an underlying business and saying, okay, I will underwrite those cash flows. You know, this company makes $10 million a year. I'll give them $40 million of, uh, of debt, sort of like four times coverage and the sort of crude calculation. That doesn't really exist, again, because you, the, the, it doesn't seem like the banks have really been re willing to get into this category, um, but it is sort of common in other, in, in other markets. And again, the difference between these two is that this would have a second lien on the assets. So it would be subordinated structurally to the senior debt. So if there ever were a liquidation, senior debt goes first, the unsecured debt goes second. So more risk is a little bit more expensive as well. Lastly, you have these sort of hybrid instruments. Again, you see the more advanced markets. You see it a little bit over here. There are certain firms that provide what we call mezzanine, which has basically equity and debt-like features. Wherein, uh, let's say for instance, you can go to a bank and get a loan. Let's say you're a, high, sort of a, you're a hyper growth company. You have some cash flow to service some interest payments, but um, you're sort of at a stage where you need more capital than that. You could have a bank come in and say, okay, look, here's a loan and I'll charge you 10% interest rate, and I'll take 5% of your company in warrants. So I have some upside as well. So that they're looking at, and the way that they, they do their calculation is they'll say, look, I think that I need a 16% return on this investment, so I'll get 10% for my current interest, and I'll try to make up the other 6% by getting equity ownership in the company. And they're willing to take that risk. So again, sort of a more sophisticated type product, but. Um, it does actually, it's actually an important product for SMEs and other parts of the world is kind of missing here. Of course, you have sort of uh, revolver and working capital facilities, so, people, so businesses, SMEs that have a lot of inventory and, and receivables can always finance that through a sort of a working capital facility, which is, um, which is essentially asset-backed. Now, I just wanted to touch on this briefly, what banks require, again, there could be various collateral requirements at the senior debt level, personal guarantees, asset pledges, they want to see some cash flow coverage. 
the covenants, they're going to look at your financial statements. I think as Piyush sort of talked about the income statement balance sheet, they're going to want to know what your EBITDA or cash flow level, levels are, what your interest coverage ratio is, how much, how much money you make to cover the sort of current interest payments, um, your leverage ratio overall in the business and whatnot. So those are just a, a number of them. But I also want to talk about, I mean, so debt equity, those are the sort of common sort of uh, ways that uh, people think about financing a business. There are other sort of mechanisms if you're sort of a fast-growing SME and um, you want to think about sort of more innovative ways to finance your growth. One of them is factoring, and, and, and really that's selling, your, um, selling down your, your current assets to generate cash. So let's say you're a business and you sell a product, you sell it on credit, you sell for 60 days worth of credit, so you're not going to collect your money for 60 days, but you're growing fast. You, you could sell that receivable at 80% of its value to somebody who's willing to, willing to take on that collection period on your behalf. So you sort of immediately cre create some liquidity for your business and finance your growth that way. That's on the receivable side. There's a similar scheme if you're sort of an inventory heavy business where you can do some retail factoring as well. And since retail is a sort of big part of the, of the landscape in, in, the, in the UAE as well as the GCC in general, I mean, it's, a, it's an important source of financing for SMEs. Um, the positives are that, again, you can, sort of, you can sort of create some liquidity in cash right away, very quickly. The consideration, I mean, it is a costly way to sell your business. I mean, you have a receivable, you know it's a good customer, you're going to collect it, and you're going to sell it at 80% of the value just to get that cash right away. I mean, you have to think about that as an entrepreneur. That's kind of a, it can be a costly way to sort of expand, but if you're in need, it may not be a bad idea. Um, and you have lack of control. All of a sudden, you have other people now contacting your customers about payments and, and that, you know, losing control over the customer relationship in that sense is not always the best thing. There's also the franchise and lease model, right? Or license model. Um, so if you're growing quickly and you have a, you have a sort of good, a good brand name in, let's say, the UAE, a good service, a proven, a proven model, then you know, your ability to sort of expand into other markets like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, wherever you're, you're thinking about, it's expensive, especially if it's an asset-intensive business where you, where, you, where you require maybe potentially some infrastructure, some real estate, or whatever it is, that can be an expensive way to expand, and you don't want to expand one store at a time. Why not franchise and lease, right? Someone else will pick up that cost. Someone else will take that on, take that burden. I mean, I guess the, um, the positives here are that you're actually going to create a steady stream of cash flow by um, getting a franchise fee. You're also going to be able to expand more rapidly as you have other people sort of finance their growth and build a brand name. But the downside is that, I mean, you've obviously created something that people are interested in licensing, and now all of a sudden you're giving that away just to grow quickly. So, again, um, it comes down to your ability to raise capital, potentially. Leasing. Um, and this is one of the things, actually, that, that we've looked at quite a bit at Abraj, and we see that a lot of companies in this region, be it schools or hospitals or whatever they are, they actually own their school or they own their hospital and they try to grow. And that's not always the most effective way. I mean, can you imagine having to pay for a new school and build a school every single time? That's going to be capital intensive. I mean, you could have somebody else build a school, build a hospital, and you lease it from them on a long-term basis. And, 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 and coming up with sort of a, what we would call sort of an asset light balance sheet model and, and focusing more on the leasing as opposed to the owning of the asset. And owning of the assets here, is, especially real estate, is sort of a, um, you know, culturally is sort of, um, is sort of the, the way people have done things. But switching to more of an asset light model can actually accelerate the growth of your business significantly. I mean, I guess the key there is you want to make sure that you don't lose the operational control of that asset. I mean, you're the one that's going to be using, using this asset. Even if somebody owns it, you want to make sure you can control it. The last one's profit sharing. Again, if you're, if you're, if you're a cash-strapped SME and you want to find innovative ways to finance your growth, um, I've seen it in the retail sector where people say, okay, I'll lease this space from you, but I can't afford your high lease rates, but I'll give you 20% of my profits on a monthly basis. You can come up with innovative schemes like that that, so, that, that, that are more variable in nature. Again, it can be an expensive way to finance your growth, especially if you do well. But nonetheless, it can sort of help you get over an intermediate hump.
after you have made the decision of uh, raising external funding, I think the most important factor is determining the valuation of your firm. Uh, valuation is a very tricky concept because there is always a disconnect between what the buyer is, is uh, paying you and what the seller is uh, willing to sell his company. So, and it's, all, it's a matter of expectations uh, because buyers basically they, they have considerations, they have their own cost of capital requirements, they have their own business plan and based on that they value the company. On the other hand, sellers who have built the business over the years, they know their business, they know what, what, what's the cost of capital of their businesses and th based on that they value their business. If you s like, this is just a cartoon, basically it just tells you the, the difference, the disconnect between the, between, the, between the expectations of buyers and sellers. And that's, that's one of the reasons that we, we as analysts spend a lot of time in, in valuing the companies. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the most important element in, in, in any investment decision process, whether, whether a private equity firm or venture capital firm is in investing in a business or from, from the seller's point of view as well, because they want to know that they have not left any value on the table. So it's, it's, it's one of the key considerations in any decision-making process with regard to evaluation. Uh, valuation. Uh, there are various ways of valuing a company. Uh, in, in, in broad terms, you can, you can divide the valuation into, valuation technique into four, five major categories. Uh, I'll start with the publicly traded comparable companies analysis. In this, what we try to do is try to assemble a set of companies which are operating in the same segment, same sector. Uh, uh, probably we would like to have the companies operating in the same country. And based on that, we try to compare a comp set, which we call comparable set of companies, and try to determine what sort of multiples they are trading at. Multiples in terms of valuation are like, you can sell the company based on a price to earning basis. You can have uh, enterprise value to EBITDA basis. So there are various techniques. The idea here is to cr create a comp set that is comparable to your company with regard to the sector, the growth prospects, and, and your future strategy. Uh, the second one is comparable acquisition analysis. It's more like, it's, it's basically, in other words, called precedent transaction analysis as well, in which we try to create a comp set again of transactions that have happened in the similar sector in a recent three to five year period, because that is the actual value that has been paid by, 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 by a willing buyer and a willing seller. So that's, that provide you a good, uh, good uh, point of valuation. Uh, the third, I think discounted cash flow uh, from technical point of view is the most accurate way of valuing a company because it's, it's forward looking, it takes into account the projection, the growth of the company, it takes into account the, the management uh, plan for expansion. So that's when we value the company, this is the, uh, this is the technique we rely on most. Then there are other non-financial parameters, and it varies from sector to sector. For example, telecom companies, they're valued by inter their value, enterprise value to subscriber, how much, uh, how much a buyer can pay for, for per, on a per subscriber basis for a telecom company. I think the same model applies on for, for internet companies as well. And, and finally, there are like other valuation techniques which are like, you do a liquidation analysis, you basically do a book value analysis. So these are the five major categories. Uh, this is what discounted cash flow is, is called absolute valuation methodology. These two, in fact these four, the rest of them are like relative valuation technology. Okay. Having said that, even though we have all these methodologies, I think valuation is, is an art, it's not a science. It, it's basically, it's based on certain assumptions uh, about the projections, about the discount rates, about the multiples, about the comp set that you have selected, about the growth rate of that particular country or the sector. So it's an imp imprecise, imp uh, 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 imprecise, imprecise thing to basically rely on one valuation. You have to always create a range of valuations in order, uh, valuation numbers in order to determine the appropriate no valuation number. Uh, there's one more thing like 
when you when you do valuation, there's a difference between valuation and price. Price is what a willing buyer and willing seller, you know, agrees to uh, conduct the transaction on. So you you use these valuation te uh, techniques, and then based on that, you arrive a number. However, it doesn't mean that the the, the buyer will uh, uh, the buyer will pay that value. Uh, one other thing is that do not when you conduct a valuation is it's important not to just rely on numbers. It's very easy to basically grow your sale and assume certain profit margin, then based on that, you arrive your net income. I think the important part is to really understand the business model, and then based on that, r use the appropriate uh, technique. Uh, the five uh, the five methodologies that I mentioned, basically, they vary in their use. For, for M&A, for mergers and acquisition transaction, the primary methodology is the DCF1. Uh, which is basically complemented by the comparable analysis. And the reverse is true for, for public market transactions. Uh, and the, uh, I think it's, all, it's important to look at three, two to three te techniques, uh, not rely on one, one valuation methodology because, because of the inherent uh, assumptions that you make for DCF, for for, for valuation multiples, I think it's always good to have, good to use two to three methodologies and then triangulate them. Okay, it's, I think fun, fundamentally it's very important to understand these two concepts, enterprise value and equity value. We, at private equity investors and venture capital ba capitalists, basically we look at enterprise value. Enterprise value is primarily the market value of the, of the assets of the company. In, in simple terms, it is the market value of the asset side of the company. If you see a normal balance sheet of a company, you have assets, you have liabilities, and you have shareholders equity. What enterprise value is, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a value of the company based on market. And enterprise, it's the value, enterprise value is the value uh, for all the capital providers of the company, like debt or equity. Equity value is basically the equity value that is attrib attrib attributable to the shareholders of the company. I'll, I'll just talk about briefly about discounted cash flow methodology. You know, Piyush talked about the income statement. Uh, income statement, we, these are the four or five steps that you have, to, uh, you have to use in order to conduct a proper DCF analysis. The first and most important is basically having a right set of projections. Uh, you have to have income statement, you have to have balance sheet, you have to cash flow statement. Uh, the, second, the second most important uh, part is to determine are you valuing the company based on a free cash flow to equity basis? Like are you trying to determine the equity value upfront or are you trying to determine the enterprise value upfront? When you determine the enterprise value, you have to deduct the net debt, the net debt that is basically attribut attributable to the debt providers of the company. So to, you have to deduct the net debt from your enterprise value in order to arrive at the equity value. Uh, the, once you have determined the, uh, the projections, the most important aspect is to determine the cost of capital of the business. Uh, when you're using, when you're trying to determine the enterprise value of the company, you have to use weighted average cost of capital. Mm, yeah, I'll go to this slide first. Weighted average cost of capital is the cost of capital for the, f for the company, for based on the uh, based on the equity uh, cost of the equity and the debt that the company has taken on its balance sheet. Uh, it's basically determined. It's an estimate of the required rate of return of debt and equity providers. Uh, I will not go into this difficult formula, but what it does is basically it's provide you the weighted average cost of the debt and equity that the, that the firm has taken. Okay, cost of equity. Uh, cost of equity varies at, as the, as the risk of the company goes up. The cost of equity moves up in in reference to the uh, to the risk of the company. The one the two one one important method for determining the cost of equity is capital asset pricing model. Basically, it's, it's, it's a model that determines the required rate of equity for a company, re required rate of return for a company based on the market risk. Uh, 
in, in comparison to the market risk for that company. So if you see, it's basically cost of equity, simply risk-free rate, which is like, which is the government rate, the rate that go, based on which government sovereigns uh, borrow funds from the market, plus the beta, beta is an estimate of the stock volatility with reference to the market. So basically the way the, the stock price moves, uh, it basically measures the volatility of the company relative to the market risk. And risk premium is, risk premium is defined as the, the risk, the return that an investor can earn in an equity market uh, over and above the risk-free rate. So that, based on these three, four parameters, you determine the cost of equity. Okay. Uh, fine. I think the other two methodologies that I talked about early on were like comparable uh, trading analysis and comparable acquisition analysis. Comparable trading analysis is probably the simplest one where you just need to create a comp set of the company, whether it's, whether it's be enterprise value to sales ratios, price to earning ratios, price to book value ratios. And then acquisition analysis is basically the, the same multiples but based on the the, the transactions that have been conducted in the market. Finally, I will summarize with this, uh, with these pros and cons of three uh, methodology that we have used. Uh, pros, DCF is the most accurate, as I told you. It basically takes into account your projection. It basically create, it involves determining the cost of capital and weighted average cost of capital of the company. But the problem with this is that it assumes a lot of assumptions. Basically, it assumes, uh, it relies on the assumption about the growth rate of the company. It, it, it implies an assumption about the bit uh, margin of the company. And it also implies an assumption about the real cost and, uh, of, of the cost of capital of the company. Trading comparable is relatively easy to use. It's basically, you have, uh, it's, you just need to create a comp set, and based on that, you arrive at the mul uh, value of your business. However, it, it basically, uh, this guy says, it's very difficult to create a pure play uh, comp set for companies. It's, it's, you will find companies in various stages of their life. Some of them are at, as Sakab said, some of them are at their early stage, or some of them are their mature stage. So creating a real comp set is very difficult. And finally, the transaction uh, comparable analysis. It's basically, it's probably the most accurate one because it represents the value that was actually paid. However, again, it is basically, it's difficult to define. And then it you need to really understand what was the motive, what was the motivation of the buyer before they, they bought the company. So uh, you have to take into account control premium. You have to, talk, uh, you have to take into account liquidity uh, discounts in, in, order to draw, in order to use this methodology. And finally, <laughs> it's all about after you do your valuation analysis, I think, again, you, it, 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 it will help you in determining what is the true value of your business, but a deal cannot be done if the willing buyer, there is no agreement between the willing buyer and willing seller. And there are disagreement, there will be disagreement because of the certain growth profile, of the certain assumptions that have been used in the model. I think that's enough. Yeah. Okay. To, uh, to be uh, expected to unveil to, to an institutional investor? Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> the due diligence will really cover three different aspects uh, primarily. One will be commercial due diligence, financial due diligence, and then the legal due diligence. So on the commercial side, you know, we may enter into a, a sort of letter of intent to invest in a company, right? That's going to be based on them, us sitting down with them, them providing us projections on the business. My company is going to grow X, right? Um, and, and really what happens during the due diligence phase is you verify that, right? You're not going to spend money, so you're not going to spend a lot of money before you get into a sort of signed agreement on verifying the market, right? 
You'll wait till you get a signed agreement. Once you have that, you'll go into due diligence. At that point in due diligence, you'll hire, you'll hire a, a food industry expert, if you're looking at somebody in the agriculture industry, to verify that the, you know, that the, that, that, that the uh, artichoke market in this country is going to grow by X percent, if that's what you're looking at, right? So you'll actually hire consultants to do that, and you will sort of drive that on the commercial side. So that's really about the market. On the financial side, I mean, we only look at businesses that have audited financial statements. So the businesses will come to us, they'll present us their financial statements, and we'll take those at face value. If they say they have $100,000 of bank debt, then they have $100,000 of bank debt. Once we get into due diligence, we're verifying all of that. We're verifying what the, um, uh, what the financial statements say. We're verifying the fact that, um, that the owner only took X amount of dollars out of the business over the last couple of years. That all of the, all of the sort of, um, all the accounting uh, methodologies are used properly within the business and that, that, that there's no sort of mismanagement in that respect. So we're verifying on the legal side then again, um, you know, for businesses that have, you know, intellectual property, we want to make sure that those intellectual property rights are properly registered. And so anything around sort of, I mean, there, there's the constitutional and the co incorporation of the company, making sure it's incorporated properly. It's done all the proper paperwork. We're not investing in a company that hasn't set up, been set up legally. That all of its contracts with its key customers, its key suppliers are legitimate, that, um, that, that they're so, still in good standing, things like that. So I mean, that type of due diligence can take a significant uh, amount, amount of time. And you know, we have actually one of our lawyers that we work with quite a bit in, uh, over here who's smiling. But um, yeah, I mean, it, I mean like, it, it, legal due diligence can take how long, Emma? About? Well, it depends on the company. Yeah. It can take, it can take from about a week, it can go to a matter of Yeah, I mean, we, we would, un unless we have some you know, unique situation where we've done an investment in one industry in the past, so we understand the industry very well, we don't have to hire an outside consultant, then yes, we'll do it in-house. Otherwise, it's worth the money to bring in a sort of, uh, somebody who has the experience at a very specific level in a specific industry, it's worth that money. And financial legal always outsourced. We, we, we're not accountants, we're not sort of, uh, uh, we don't have that sort of uh, the time to do all that it takes to sort of verify those accounts, so it is worth hiring that as well, yeah. Yeah, Va valuation, no. And so during the due diligence phase, you may, you may find things in a company that say, actually, the market's only growing X, or actually, you know, the, the company's earnings weren't really this if you factor some, some certain things into account. We looked at a company recently and um, found out that a lot of their earnings were actually came from foreign currency translation, right? Not, not, not from the actual operations of the business. They had favorable foreign, foreign currency uh, translation. So, I mean, how, do, you, do you factor that into the valuation? Is, you would only factor that into the valuation if you believe that that was going to occur over the next 10 years. But who's going to make that, right, projection? So you, that wasn't known to us before we got into the due diligence, what the sort of... The, uh, the, the, the ratio of that impact was. So things like that that you learn during DD. So a, a very extensive on a DD. How long do you think you can improve in the background to get the uh, I think documentation, I think depending on the size of the transaction, obviously, if the smaller transaction, we take about three to four weeks in, to complete the due diligence. And then another two to three weeks in completing the documentation. That is, uh, yeah, I think for small transaction we have, in the, re the recent small transaction that we have done, we have completed the DD in three to four weeks time. Uh, after the agree agreement on the LOI, obviously LOI in a small transaction is a key document uh, where we basically try to iron out most of the issues upfront, including the valuation, the various board rights, various reserve matters, we want to, include as many points as possible. And once we agreed the LOI, and Emma has helped us many times, but uh, so once we agreed the LOI, we basically close it and, in, in, you know, com try to complete the due diligence between four weeks' time and then uh, I think another two to three weeks to complete the due, uh, documentation. I think, I think over here in this region, I mean, the, the, the closing process sort of takes a little bit longer than it would in a, a market where people understand the terms much, much better. So when, when it comes to sort of reserve matters and you know the rights that an investor would have sitting on the board of a company 
That you don't have to explain twice when you're sort of in markets where private equity financing is more prevalent. Over here, we have more family-run businesses that are you know, first, uh, second generation businesses that are opening up to investors for the first time. Naturally, they're going, they're, going, they're going to want to understand those things a little bit more. And so the process of negotiating those terms, explaining those terms can take a little bit longer. I just wanted to ask you, uh, you said when, uh, uh, when somebody seeks uh, 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 private equity or venture capitalist, uh, they also will get into the strategy of the business. Uh, how healthy is that for uh, an entrepreneur who believes in his or her uh, idea and sometimes or most of the times they don't want anyone interfering in the strategy or how to do the business? Actually, investments where we're coming in at the, not the venture capital stage. I mean, if you're talking about businesses that are at that sort of that early life cycle, right, and they're looking for venture capital to come in, I mean, that's what the venture capitalists do. They're generally people who have industry experience. They're people who've had successful businesses in that industry before. And the entrepreneur who's bringing them in, I mean, is expecting that sort of experience to come to the table and help shape their strategy. For us, um, where we generally tend to be less industry specific, um, our value add comes in different ways. So, you know, classic examples of uh, our investment in maktoub.com. Very successful transaction for us when we made, we made the investment in 2004, roughly, exited in 2007. Um, helped grow the business significantly. But you know what? We didn't actually know much about the internet and portals, didn't have prior experience doing deals in that space. But what we did know was how to help institutionalize a business, how to structure a board, how to structure stock option plans, how to, how to think about putting metrics into the business that management could then use to grow their business, and how, how to help them think from being a Jordanian company to a regional company, and, and sort of providing support that way. Not necessarily um, industry um, sort of like business strategy planning support from that perspective, but strategic support in another way in helping grow the business. I mean, at the end of the day, we try to back good management teams, right? We're not trying to go in there and run the business. And I think that uh, sort of uh, most private equity firms and venture capital firms will tell you that. So it is about backing the good management teams. And so, yeah. Um, well, I have a question. I mean, you said you only, uh, I mean, venture into companies who, uh, companies who have uh, audited accounts. I mean, like, uh, I'm running a small uh, company. I mean, like, uh, unfortunately, we are back to three. We were up to nine. Uh, I found it, I mean, like, very unrealistic to have a full-time accountant employed. So we have an external accountant going then, I mean, like, uh, into the subject of, of having audited accounts. I mean, like, uh, we don't have the money for this, okay? I mean, like, uh, basically, I mean, like, uh, it's, it's a circle where you spin around and I've, I, I I mean, for small companies, I found it very unrealistic to have, I mean, like basically the same requirements as for, for large corporations because most of the companies, let's say less than 10 people, they may have an accountant. However, going to the next step, getting audited accounts and, and everything, I mean, like, uh, I mean, there's no money for it. I'm sorry, I mean, I cannot go yeah. to an auditor and, and listen, yeah, well, our service starts, I mean, like at uh, 20,000 dirhams and, uh, uh, and then there's a minimum requirement of this and that. So by the end of the day, I mean, like, uh, uh, where is this money meant to come from? Yeah, it's going to come from probably angel investors because, I mean, as institutional investors managing third-party money, we have certain sort of responsibilities to our investors in how we sort of invest their money because it's not our money. And so we have to take the necessary precautions. And, and one of the things is, and, and actually, you know, when we started this SME initiative a year, ago, a year ago, and we've looked at 180 transactions over the past year, companies from, you know, that are, that, that are losing money with, with less than a million dollars of revenue, all the way to companies that have $50 million of revenue. And every single one of those, has there been a deal which didn't have audited financials? Actually, there hasn't been one deal that's come across that did not have audited financials. Okay, okay. Next, next thing is, I mean, like, then again, I mean, like, uh, a startup company looking for venture capital, how do they get audited accounts? <laughs> again, I mean, if, if there's, not, if there's, I mean, like, just the idea, uh, I mean, like, uh, and now transactions have been taking place, 
I mean, like, uh, yeah. So, I mean, are they not qualifying? A, 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 again, angel financing and sort of the, the, the type of diligence and, and the perspective that angel financiers take is different. They're more akin to that type of risk, more comfortable with it. Because if you remember that sort of slide I had up there when it was the venture capital down to the private equity, that was more the institutional side. Then you had the sort of um, angel networks and family friends. That's your network. Those are people who sort of can take a leap of faith based on who the person is. And I think that that's probably more suitable to them. But happy to, I mean, in terms of where you're going to go for funding? Yeah, I mean, I want to comment I mean, uh, on this because yeah. uh, I've had my company for seven years and I've had the two acquisition offers and uh, a JV. And uh, to be honest, everything started coming into place once I started paying for other things. Uh, uh, for other thing with Ernest and Young, and it cost me a lot of money at the size that I was running at. But before that, you have a lot of losses. You think you're saving money, but when you see your tax, uh, your, your your taxes, and and, and you're, you're trying to save up on these kind of things, you you end up really regretting not paying that money when you could have. And then once you have the the uh, the, the, the the four big companies, Ernest and Young, Deloitte, uh, PCH, whatever, it helps you in the banks as well. So if you're not going to sell, if you're going for for a debt. It does give you a very, very strong backing, backing once, you, once you're applying for a loan uh, at the bank. <coughs> you need to look at that. But uh, I have a, a question. Sure. Now, the, I, I think one of the, the, the big problems that you mentioned is the uh, institutionalization that, that a company like yours offers a company like mine. But the, the, the one thing that, that always made me refuse to, to sell any part of the company uh, was that I always felt that I'm still too small to sell it uh, right now because I can easily get bought out in two to five years. How do you how do you protect yourself against that? Because if I if I sell today 30% of my company or 40% to a company that has a lot of cash, and then you know two three years later we're doing good, we can grow bigger. But I don't have you know more money to put into any growth plans, so they start you know buying 10 and 20% in, 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 in no time, you don't have any control in your company anymore. How, how, what, how, do, you, how do you kind of you know, fend off it against that? Because at some point, you, you are emotionally attached to your company and you, and you believe you can still put more into it and, and, and stay associated with it. You, you don't want to sell. You just, you just want to grow it. I think from one angle to look into that is like now the pie of the size of the company is growing. So it's basically, if you're owning 100% of a small company, now you, if, if with this growth capital that you're getting in your company, the size of the company has doubled or quadrupled. Now you're owning, although you're owning a smaller percentage of the company, but, it, but in economic value terms, the value of your net worth has grown. So that's why I think it's always good to have, like... But like I said, you, yeah. you're not just calculating how much you own of the company yeah. because it's not really about financial ownership, it's really about emotional ownership as well. I want to be the one known for you know, growing this company and making a success. It's, it's part of the, the equation you consider. So, so for example, if a brush uh, comes in and three years later that they, they, they want to sell out, how, how, how do you guarantee what kind of next partner you're going to get? If you guys decide to sell, you know, to sell your share of the company to a partner I don't like. I'd like to just intervene. I also work at Abraj in case you're wondering. I want to put things, the conversation a little bit into perspective. So I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and then I'll answer your question. When we look at investing in a business, almost regardless of stage, and I think it might be useful at some point to clarify the different stages of investment. It's not just that we want to look at a business and think, okay, we can make money on behalf of our investors. And by the way, it's on behalf of our investors. And we can add value to that company. What entrepreneurs such as yourself have to also look at is, is Abraj Capital actually going to add value to my business? Right? This is a tight liquidity environment. But let's just take a flight of fancy and go back two or three years where liquidity was plentiful. Right? You could go to a bank, maybe not as a small business, but in a larger buyout space and get cash almost um, as much as you wanted. The type of business that we saw that came to us for those, those kind of requirements, we tended to turn down. Why? 
if it's only the money that you're going to go to an institution for, it is probably a mistake. You might not have a choice, don't get me wrong, right? And my advice is, in general, if you can get cash, yeah, take it. But more importantly than this is, you have to believe that the institution that's sitting with you in the boardroom, in the management meetings, in the committees, add val adds value to a business over and beyond the cash. What does that mean? You might think like, well, I've got a serious board problem, maybe a slightly larger business, and say, I can't really acquire talent. Maybe I'm a 10, 20 million dollar company, I've got to get a kick-ass CEO on board, but if I'm a sole entrepreneur and I don't have an institution on board, that's just not going to help me. So just to repeat that, to be very, very clear, is it's not just the money. If you don't believe that Abrash Capital has some value add to this, then it's pointless. Right? For that matter, any institution might be an individual or whatever else. The role of private equity in and of itself is certainly to provide financing. And by the way, you'll meet any GP, general partner, private equity investor in the world, and you know what they're gonna tell you? Saying, oh, you know, we have a differentiated strategy, we add value to our portfolio companies. Everybody says it. I dare a lot of people to actually prove the type of value add that you have. We're very lucky in our part of the world, and you've heard this a lot today, is that, let's face it, it's a relatively archaic market. Let's face it, the value add that you can bring is relatively simple. And no offense to all my friends on the uh, investment teams that you have, when you start looking at things and saying, well, can I help you rationalize your balance sheet? Right? Is that going to cost you $100,000 in consultancy, or can you have somebody internally at Abraj saying, this is the kind of couple of structure that makes sense for you? Culturally speaking, as an entrepreneur, when you're bringing institutional money, you better be 100% sure that you want to keep your emotion in. Hell, we want you to keep emotionally attached to the business. But you know what? It's a step. You're going to have to change the culture inside the firm to understand one thing and one thing only. We're going to want to work with you to have you achieve the best of your potential because, you know, if you don't, our investors won't make any money. If our investors won't make any money, we're not going to be able to put this thing together for the next two, three, four, five years. Are we doing that? Okay, great. I, I, that doesn't answer your question directly, but just to, uh, just to maybe address it a little bit more, uh, and I promise I'll give you back the mic. We did a co um, an acquisition called uh, Global Education Management Systems. I don't know if you guys know this business. It's got the largest, it's the largest school business in this part of the world. They got the Wellington School and a couple more in Dubai. Exactly, all those. It took us a year and a half to execute on that transaction. This is 2006. This is when there was still a lot of money in the market. You know what we did for a year and a half? We made 100% sure that we were 100% aligned with the entrepreneur that was in this business. Why? Because you can do all this stuff. This is great. I don't understand half of it. I'm on the sales side. But once that agreement, what that valuation comes out of the drawer, it's not worth the paper it's written on. Once you've lost the capacity to look your promoter in the eye and say, I've added the value that I told you I'd add value that I would, and you in turn have delivered what you promised you'd deliver, then you don't have a partnership, do you? So one thing that we did, for example, with GEMS is we structured it in a way where, you know, Sonny Varki, who's the founder of GEMS, was very, very conscious saying, well, you know, I'm selling you 25% of my business, and he asked us the exact same question. You know, what are you going to do with the 25%? I don't want some strange institution that I don't know about, you know, um, buying that business from you, sorry, that stake from you. What we did is we explained to him, well, what's the nature of our work? What's the value add we're going to bring to your organization? This is what we have to do in terms of liquidity. Why? Because it's not our money. It is not our money. Investors give us cash to make sure that we protect their interest first and foremost, and thereafter make sure that we accelerate that rate of growth. So you spend a lot of time with the entrepreneurs. God knows these guys on the Riada team spend a lot more time than maybe the private equity guys making sure that the alignment is there. I promised five minutes I took a lot of time, sorry. <laughs> Uh, when you talked about type of uh, debt, and then you said that it's, uh, sometimes it's better to go with leasing instead of buying, that way you're light and you're not very heavy. But I found that usually in uh, investors or money, people have money, they say, wait a minute, I'm going to give you money and I'm going to burn it in salaries and rent. It's better for you, for example, to buy the building, and then I have my money is protected by the equity itself instead of just going and working capital. How do you balance between this and that? So. 
one of the things that we've seen is a lot of uh, people over here in this part of the world actually look at sort of their net income and their profit margin. They don't actually look at the return on equity, right? And, and sort of maximizing the return on equity, which is actually the most important calculation that anyone uh, sort of as an investor or sort of entrepreneur should be making, right? I mean, there is value to be had using debt. There is value to be had sort of not necessarily acquiring the assets that you don't need to acquire because, again, it sort of creates this balance sheet which, which lowers, I think, you know, people start talking your return on assets in a way that, um, that impacts, impacts the return that it generates for investors. So I think it's, it's about really thinking about your business from a return on equity standpoint. And when you do that, um, I think you'll find that leasing can make sense in a lot of cases. Not every case, not every case, but where, where, the, where the ownership of that asset is, is not the core business. If you're, you know, we talked about schools and hospitals, their core business proposition is managing schools and hospitals, not owning assets. They're not a real estate company. Real estate risk is priced differently. And so mixing that in to a balance sheet actually doesn't create an optimal balance sheet. So you have to really think about what is the core of my business and is this core to my business? If it's not, why not lease? I mean, um, you know, another example is sort of airlines and, and, and their sort of strategies with regards to buying and leasing. Um, but uh, I, I think it, a lot of it comes down to your business model. So when I started an investor like you, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, it'd be about the, the cash flows of the business that we would look at. I mean, like if they were going to buy that plane and they were going to, you know, and you were going to feel secure by that plane because you were sort of an equity investor in that company, I mean, you're assuming there that there's no debt that has a prior lien on that plane, right? And if there's no debt that has a prior lien on that plane, then you're using all equity to buy an asset. Your return on assets is actually going to be quite low. Your return on equity is going to be quite low because you're buying something, a, a, a long-term asset with all equity like that. So... Again, it would depend on the situation, but in general, no, I mean, I, it wouldn't be seen as a negative to be leasing, no. No, it would just have to fit, fit in the context of that business model. Yeah. Um, actually, let me go in order. Just a question about, uh, let's say if you have a business and you're, you have a couple of products and you just want to find investment for one certain product, would you be, sell, uh, would you be looking for venture capitalists in the main business or can you like sub do a subcategory and say, listen, I just want money for, I just need somebody to invest on this particular part of the business. I mean, how does that go about in terms of financing? Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, like, I mean, like one quick thing on that, I mean, is uh, we're very careful about this. Um, we want, when we, when we invest, to invest in 100% of an entrepreneur, right? So, I mean, if they're splitting their business into two and saying, okay, you know, I split my, split my business into A and B, come into B, when they're spending half their time on A, that's not a situation that we want to be in, right? Because if B all of a sudden goes wrong and they focus 100% of their time on A, they have that option, right? We want to be where the entrepreneur is 100%. So splitting up the business that way and asking someone to come into a specific part of it is, you know, wouldn't be sort of the ideal situation for us. We want to come in sort of where we have 100% of what the entrepreneur is doing. Yeah, it's, it's a matter of valuation, right? So basically you determine the valuation of the company based on like you have product A, product B. So it's a consolidated approach. So obviously we need to see the whole profile of the company, what are those products are. So as, as Saqib said, it has to be, we would like to buy the entrepreneur, like basically invest in, the, invest in the entrepreneur and we would like to have his time. So we would look at the consolidated value of the business, not on an individual basis. Hi, good evening. Uh, just a quick thing, actually, which, in fact, to address his question, we, I run a very small education institute, which has now got invested into, but we had the same problem. No one was willing to invest until we met an institutional investor who declined us, but they came in personally then. So the guy said, okay, he became an angel investor. But he also told us the same thing, was that there's no pain without gain, so he says you have to spend the 10, 12,000 dirhams, get your books audited, and then approach us. So I think you can't really run away from getting your books audited. And we had the same problem as our friend here, where we had one product which wasn't doing well, so the same investor came and said, 
we'll take you, but our advice is you have to shut this division down, and then we'll look at your valuation in this format. So they gave us advice on that, okay? That's just my experience. But I had a couple of questions, which was, how many years running do you actually look for a company to have in the sense of they should be running for at least one year, two years, three years? From your perspective, that's, I've got three small questions, yeah? One is that, what's the average ticket size? So we don't do business worth less than $1 million, $10 million, $5 million. What's the percentage you want? We'll not take a stake less than 25, 50. And the last one is, how long do you stay in for? Three years, five years, seven years? Let me start with the last one. Our investment horizon is around three to five years. We try to uh, monetize our investment between three to five years. Supposing period. you're stuck in and it's not grown, would you stay on? Or then do you say, let's no. take it out, cut our loss, and try and find a better business to no, reinvest? No, no. The fund life is eight to 10 years, right, Saqib? Eight years? It, so basically, the fund, the fund through which we will be making investment uh, has a life of more than eight years. So basically, we can stay Maximum. in the business uh, till that period. Uh, okay. The ticket size, I think we're talking about uh, our sweet spot is around five to seven million dollars for SMEs, but we can write checks of less around one million dollars all the way to 15 million dollars. So one to 15, okay. And the first question you said about- How many years running? The company should be okay. operational for, you don't take from, greenfield from, from SME perspective, we are in, we are, we are willing to invest in companies which are pre-profit, okay. but, but pre-revenue companies at this stage, we are not looking at it. Basically, in, there would be certain sectors such as uh, information technology where we would look to, in, to, to invest as venture capital and take the startup risk, but in traditional SME sectors, uh, we, are, we, are, we are interested in looking, obviously, companies which have two to three years of operating history, positive cash flow. However, we are interested in looking at companies which are pre-profit, but not pre-revenue. Okay. It's the way we define SME is like, yeah. Would you take 10% equity? Supposing someone is willing to offer only 10, which doesn't give you too much board control, not 24%. If it comes down to but we really want to add value. Okay. And then how do you exit? If it's not listed on the exchange, or if it's, how would you actually find the exit then for your investors? If you've invested in us, and we're not listed on the exchange, or there's no real, how would you actually exit the business? That's, that's what we do, right? We're just trying to grow our business from small to medium and medium to large. So you take it to the IPO level? Yeah, you open up that business to new sort of avenues for financing and other people who are interested in it. And we saw it when we were we invested in Mustafa, we had it. Also, we got close to Yahoo. Yahoo never would have bought it when it was a small company based in Turkey. We ended up acquiring it. A branch has done about 21 exits over the last okay. Okay, so it doesn't, not necessary IPO. But it becomes interesting to a regional or international player. Okay, thanks. Just to clarify, your exit is the sale of the company. Exit is the sale of the company. Yeah, I mean, generally, you can have sort of contractual rights where you can, the owner can buy back your shares, so it's not a sale of the company. You can, you can, you can do a, a, a sale of the state, not necessarily the whole company. Well, um, I'll just start with a really quick brief so that you can give me the right advice. I started the baker business in Egypt two years ago, and we partnered with um, one of the biggest chains in the retail, and we stayed with a minority. And then this big chain is spinning off the whole business, and we left with a tag-along right. So um, I need to know what's your advice on that if I'm changing my partner, which has a majority, and what's the right methodology of valuation if I'm exiting? Yep. Yeah. So I mean, do you know who the, you know who the other partner is? Nope. Not yet. Yeah. I mean, then then it's I mean like I'll, I'll put it this way: when we do a deal, 
every deal we do is like getting married. That's how we sort of internally call it. I mean, it's that sort of <laughs> relationship that you sort of build, right? Um, you know, all legal papers aside, you actually have to look the other person in the eye and be on the same page with them in all respects. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, the legal papers are not going to save you. You know, no court system is going to save you. You have to see eye to eye with the other entrepreneur. It was like Mohammed was saying when we did the GEMS transaction with Sunny Varki, you know, we got there, but it's not, it takes time. So jumping into a situation like that, right, with, uh, with not knowing your partner is a very dangerous one. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you do have the tag along rights, probably something, something to think about unless you get to know your partner very well um, and feel, take comfort in that from a valuation perspective, bakery retail business. Yep. Probably be, be, yeah, same store sales. I mean, yeah, I, but um, I guess we have a very solid shareholders agreement. But if you say that the paper wouldn't save me, then yeah, I paper, mean, I, I don't I depend much on paper. it. I mean, for sure, you wouldn't want to go off of paper. You would really want to get comfortable with the other party. So. Yeah. What about the valuation methodology? If it's uh, kind of a not a startup, but it's like it's been in the market for two years now. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we really see the potential of growth. So what do you think is the fair way to evaluate such a business? I think uh, for small businesses, like two to three years old businesses, I think the appropriate uh, methodology would be have to do a DCF analysis because you need to incorporate the growth aspect of the of, of your company. Because any other multiple, obviously the size of the company does not allow you to have a you know, comp set that would that is relatively comparable to your company. So I think the appropriate methodology is to basically use DCF. And obviously, since it's a small company, growth potential it seems very significant. So you have to project two to five years of projections, and then create a valuation based on uh, prepare the valuation based on the DCF mm -hmm. methodology. I think that would be the most appropriate one. And, and just to sort of add to that, I mean, when somebody is going to value your business, they're going to do it on the basis of the existing resources that you have. So they're not going to say, oh, you're going to open 50 more stores if you don't have the capital to do it. So if you only have the capital for your existing stores, they're going to look at your existing stores and value the revenues of those stores and the earnings of those stores yeah. only. What if it's an organic growth? And it, it, it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, organic without cap, assuming capex. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, that DCF would be the methodology All right, for you. Thank you.